This is a talk I gave for Focus as part of our professional development lunch series. It's during lunch and it's actually right next to our kitchen. So sometimes you can hear people warming up their food during this. The parts that I've cut from the talk, I've cut the activities because otherwise it'd just be a video of us filling out worksheets. At those points, I do recommend you pause the video and then fill out the worksheet yourself. There is a link in the description below. Also, there's a link to the slides. They're a little bit hard to see um, because of the lighting of the room. So you can follow along with those as well. I'd recommend you follow along with the worksheet because otherwise, if you just hear this but then don't do anything about it, it's not very likely to have much of an effect. I've included the discussion we have as part of the case studies. I recommend you go through them first yourself to come up with your own ideas and then see what the rest of the group said and that way you can get even more ideas. And let's start by telling a story. Um, those of you who saw the email uh, description of this event, this is the story in that. Uh, Rachel was actually there because it's from my first year as a missionary. The sneak uh, preview of the ending of the story, I do successfully make it to Haiti. There is a blurry picture of me there. But a week before I'm going to Haiti, I haven't bought any of the supplies such as a mosquito net, which is very important to have. And it was entirely my own fault for not giving myself enough time to do it. So it started out as a good thing. Um, as a team, every month, we'd set three and only three personal goals, some related to you know, missionary things, some related to personal things. And so for the month of March, I set a goal to meet one-on-one -on -one with everyone in Bible study because I thought by doing that, then they'll be more likely to come to Bible study because I found the people who were there all the time were the ones I was really good friends with. The people who were never there, I hardly saw ever, and then there was like this 50-50 group, which would have been a fine goal, except we had spring break. So instead of four weeks, it was three weeks to try to meet with everyone. So I have way overbooked myself with students, and so we get to the point of, it's a week before Haiti, and I have not, um, I have not bought anything. So I'm hoping that some students cancel, because like if one student cancels and I have an hour, that's not enough time to leave campus, go buy all the things, and come back. So I'm hoping a few students in a row will cancel. One of the days I text everyone because I don't want to show up to the cafeteria, and then they're like, oh yeah, I forgot. So I'll text them ahead of time to see, are they actually coming? So I do that, and that one day, everyone canceled, which never happens. Usually a few do, but everyone canceled, and I heard an audible voice say, don't make me do that again. <laughs> that is compulsive busyness in missionary life. A lot of the time we think about it in terms of like, you know, the really driven business person who neglects health and family, but it can also creep into ministry as well. So what I'm going to go through is, this is a three-level framework for thinking about meaningful work. I've adapted it from two different other ones. I think that this makes more sense than either individual one, but if you'd like to know where I got it, let me know. It's pyramid in that if you fail at the bottom one, you fail at all three. The first one is vision. If you lack a clear vision for what meaningful work is, then you really can't do much at all. I did not have a vision for what I was trying to do, and so I way overbooked myself. You might think, oh, just because I have this clear vision, therefore, I'm just going to accomplish a lot all the time. What's getting in the way is various psychology things, which could be just your temperament and how you approach work, but also potentially wounds that are at play. So one of mine that definitely was at play with this was defining my worth by what I do. That's not good. And then finally, you have the systems, the apps, all of that stuff. A lot of times people just focus on that one, but if you haven't taken into account your vision, if you haven't taken into account your psychological makeup, then the system you come up with won't be as good. So I'm not going to give you a system, I'm going to instead teach you how to make them yourself, because that's a lot better. So what you'll learn, that acronym ASPAT means all students should be able to, students are you guys. So you should be able to define what is meaningful work or productivity for you, and then list what are the psychological things getting in the way. Instead of just create a system, it'll be you identify a problem or several, and then what are some solutions, what one am I gonna pick? Now just identifying that isn't enough. Obviously you should make a plan for doing it, and my favorite one there is make a, make a plan plan. It's very meta. The idea with that is yeah, if you make a plan now, that's really cool. 
But what happens in three months? What happens in a year when you're going to either make a new plan for this same problem or for a different problem? It's basically you helping out future you. So you're telling future you how you made this plan, what criteria you, you use, stuff like that. If we run out of time, this is the one we're not going to get to because um, we have 35 minutes until the next meeting starts. But hopefully we'll get through it all. And there, of course, is the ASPAT. This would not be an MPD-related uh, presentation if that guy didn't make an appearance. He'll be showing up several times throughout also. So we start with vision. So our culture definitely lacks vision for, uh, for productivity and meaningful work. Either the compulsive busyness that I described, but then the other extreme of just kind of aimless, eh, whatever, I don't know what I want to do. And I think also we tend to speak in terms of productivity versus meaningful work. So it's about, I'm doing these things, but we don't ask the question, are those the correct things to do? So when I was talking to a bunch of you guys about, um, about this topic, you got, I got some interesting definitions. So one person said, my definition is never missing a deadline, but not in the sense of just that, but the identity of I'm a reliable teammate and my teammates know they can count on me to get my stuff in on time. Someone else said, doing the right things, doing them well, and making a difference. And then one from a blog that I follow, his definition isn't even work-related. It's that if his grandkids come over unexpectedly, he can drop what he's doing and play with them. He's not delayed on his projects. He has that flexible time. So take three minutes on your sheet of paper to write down what is meaningful work for right, so you. So now we're going to move on to the psychology thing, which I roughly categorized in three different categories. It's not, they're not perfect categories. Um, as I go through, if there's any that strike you as especially pertinent to you, go ahead and write them down. But also there will be time at the end once I've gone through some of the common ones to write them down and think on it as well. So first one up here is fear, guilt, and shame. Um, this can show up in a lot of ways. Anyone who's ever done MPD will know that. You know, whether perceived or actual, I don't want to dial the phone, what's going to happen? Or um, I'll feel bad if I don't do this, therefore I probably should, like sort of nagging ourselves into doing things. And I think the biggest way this shows up is boundaries, whether in terms of not setting them well or not respecting them well. Like, oh, there's this project I need to do, but someone's interrupting me, I feel bad saying no, even though I really should. Or vice versa, I haven't given myself enough time to do something, I'm going to not respect a boundary someone else has so that I can get them to answer my question. So that's one common one. Another one, lack of clarity. Again, lots of different ways this can show up. Um, I don't think anyone here is super unclear with what their role is overall. I think the job scorecard and all of that's been really helpful. But on a day-to-day -day basis, you could ask, well, what is my job right now? I have these five projects I'm working on, but what one should I be doing right now? That's a tough one. So, tyranny of the urgent is one way this can come up. As in, I don't know what to do, but I just got an email, I'll do that. Or I already talked about what should I be doing right now. Inability to pivot. Um, one of my friends had this example of, he was he set a goal for working out and being healthier. A couple weeks in, his knees started hurting, so he stopped and then just didn't work out at all. Which was a smart move in that you don't want to injure your knees, but it didn't, he didn't set a different goal to achieve the same result of health things. So if you don't have clarity on what your end result is, you're just not going to try new things. And then finally, the momentum and motivation. One way I see this for myself is that long to-do lists just don't get done. If I have like three things to do, I'll do them. But if I have 10 things to do, I'm much less likely. And then three other ways this can show up. Planning fallacy is a particularly nasty one. Things take longer than you expect, even if you've done them before. Even if you know that planning fallacy exists, it still doesn't eliminate its effect. It's weird. I don't know why it does that. Decision fatigue, the more decisions you make on a given day, the worse decisions you start to make, or the less likely you are to make any decisions at all. I think a big example of this is you get home, you want to watch Netflix, you spend more time deciding what to watch than you do actually watching it, because you've you hit decision fatigue at that point. And then analysis paralysis is one I fall into. I have to have everything planned out before I even start, and then you just don't do anything. So go ahead and take three minutes to identify for you what are the common ones that get in the way. Yes, but again, so we'll check in. We've, we've done the first two. Um, we're not going to jump straight into, for yourself, identifying the problems and solutions. If you flip your sheet over, there are case studies. There are five of them, and there are 11 of you, so pair up. One of you will be in a group of three. 
and just pick one to do. Actually, you should probably announce out loud which one you're doing so the other groups don't get it. You don't have to do a fully exhaustive thing, but for each one you'll ask, so what are some of the psychological things they're facing? How does it affect them? What are some of the problems? What are some potential solutions? And then we'll come back together and share as a group. We're skipping the vision part of that because it'd be really hard to guess what their vision for meaningful work is. All right, I should probably be visible in this, shouldn't I? <laughs> yeah, whatever. It's, whatever. It'll be my fine. disembodied voice leading the rest of it. All right, so wrapping up the case studies, uh, we'll just go f down the list. And so, yeah, whatever group, go through and say the things that you identify to answer those questions up on the slides. So you're group Number one. one. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, okay, so psychological things. We put um, the fear of accomplishing task, letting others down, and decision fatigue. Did you want me to read that? Or just go ahead and look. However you want to okay. do it. Okay. <laughs> um, the problems that could be solved, um, a day-to-day -day action plan, dependency on others to complete the task as a problem, and multiple pro projects that need to be done, need to be completed. So to solve, we put create a list of projects, prioritize by deadline, and communicate with others involved and give them deadlines. Cool. Does anyone have other possible ideas? If not, it wasn't your case today, so you don't necessarily have to. <laughs> cool. All right, let's go on to the second one. So we had a person um, that had a hard time um, saying no. Uh, had a lot of projects, but people would come and stop by and, or receiving an email, pretty much. So we, um, considering that the no factor was there, that uh, he or she was unable to say no to others, so I um, had an issue with the boundaries, how to how to tell people that let's you know come back later on. Um, also, lack of clarity, partially you know choosing to help somebody at that moment when they really needed to focus on something else. And um, I think it was for us mostly the priorities, um, what's really more important, um, and just not being. Um, assertive enough to say, listen, I can't do this right now, can you come back later? So we figured out a couple of things what uh, he or she could do to, uh, actually it's John, sorry, he. <laughs> 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 uh, so um, to either find a place that he can hide and do his work, <laughs> you know, um, or as uh, over here the assistants sometimes do, we put a headset on and you know not to bug us <laughs> at that point, <laughs> uh, or just come back later. And um, what was the other one? Yeah. Well, I said to reflect on priorities, both at work, because it says he feels pulled in different directions, but also overall, recognizing that his family is more important than, you know, he hasn't a lot of time to do his work, otherwise it will start to affect his other priorities, essentially. So to get clear on where things fall and because of that I'll have more confidence to tell people hey this is what I really need to be doing can you check back in an hour can you lunch or something cool group three is that you guys in the back it is we'll go ahead and read it first Lauren is a really social person and loves to talk to her co-workers and finds it really helps her relax in the middle of a stressful day but all her office mates are very laser focused and so she feels like she's not pulling her weight if she doesn't do that when around them. So she keeps the same level of focus as they do, but finds herself unable to concentrate after a while. At the end of the day, she doesn't have much to show for it, especially when compared to her office mates. We thought one of the main things she was dealing with was guilt, um, a sense comparing herself to her office mates and feeling that she had to keep the exact same focus as them. Um, so we thought one thing she possibly could do would be to organize her time to be like, okay, here's my social time and here's where I need to focus and get things done. Uh, the other thing though is maybe she needs to get permission from someone, from her manager to be herself to say, hey, it's okay if you take more breaks than your office mates, so, you know, so long as it's a responsible, etc. And then Joe also said maybe she needs another job. <laughs> <laughs> so she's, she's, every day she's stressed. <laughs> 
-hmm. and to deal with it she needs to stop working and go socialize so you know maybe there's a better fit for her you know like <laughs> somewhere <laughs> Uh, there's a or else make her peace with being stressed. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a little bit of an identity thing there, too, of, like, the comparison. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I have to be like the rest of my team mm -hmm. to, like, figure out what is their strong time and when they need that and, like, communicate that with the team. And then it eliminates the guilt thing, too, if the teammates also know. Um, and maybe it's either they, yeah, they take more frequent breaks or um, maybe it's uh, like coming in later and staying later or vice versa, coming in earlier, leaving earlier, like figuring out what makes them tick. Not good for? Do you want me to be the extra thing to and then you can Okay. Um, Steven wants to get in better shape. He hasn't made it a priority on his, in his time on campus. He creates a short uh, workout plan and seems to be going well. A few weeks in, he notices his knee is starting to hurt during his workout. He ignores it, but it doesn't go away, so he stops working out. A few months later, he is not, he is not in better shape, and now he's discouraged about it. Um, so just for psychology, the inability to pivot, as Mike said earlier, but then also, um, like later, guilt, and um, yeah, I don't, I mean, everything comes back to identity, right? But like, yeah, just like not being able to follow through with like, this is something that I want, and so, so I'm gonna do this for, yeah, for like my own health, but. And then um, having like a good game plan, plan, and then maybe changing that want into a need, and so he'd have a little bit more follow through. Um, usually people don't just want to get in better shape, they need to get in better shape. So just like switching his like motivations to like change um, would like help him come up with smaller game plans. Cool. Can I add one thing and maybe um, not be ashamed that he kind of tripped and didn't finish, you mm -hmm. know, because very often we put ourselves down and like, oh, I was supposed to do it, I didn't, and it's like, you make yourself feel worse. Mm -hmm. That's the guilt and shame. And mm -hmm. that again, I didn't do it. Totally. We also talked a little bit about focusing more on like <coughs> lifestyle changes that can actually, that are actually doable for a long period of time rather than I'm going to work out all the time for a month and then I'll be in better shape. Um, instead of saying like, you know what, I'm going to work out once a week for the rest of my life. And then once I can do that, then I'll add. Once a week for the, a month. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again for the next month. Also, what about getting a personal trainer? Like, get a person that you pay, and where you're really wasting your money if you don't actually do the things where they tell you to do them. Yeah. Commitment device. And you have to show up. Yes, and you have to show up. <laughs> See, there's lots of possible solutions to things. <laughs> we all going to start looking at them. <laughs> all right, group five. Uh, Samantha works with missionaries a lot, and a part of her job is, involves getting a hold of missionaries and waiting for them to respond. Some are really prompt about responding, and others not so much. Sometimes weeks go by before she realizes she hasn't heard from some of them, and so needs to comb through her email to see who has and hasn't responded. Some of the psychological problems we identified were a perceived lack of control of the situation, like this is that person's fault, and I just am bearing the consequences. The size of recovery when she realizes they haven't replied seems really big, so I can imagine that would be like a psychological barrier, like, uh, I know this person hasn't replied, but it's going to take me forever to like dig through my email to find out when the last time we talked was, and then it takes longer than planned to recover. And the last one was like having guilt or shame about not checking in with those people. Actually, you want to do this? So I wrote down this. There we go. And then the solutions, yeah. yeah. Our solution is just a better way of organizing it, such as tracking it not in an email, um, like as or in smart sheets, or putting them in a folder in your email, um, and having putting deadlines into the original email, so when you follow up, the people have a context of why you're following up. Oh, and also, if they don't reply to email, like just use a different way of contacting them. Like if you have to talk to them on Snapchat. Just do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's going to take to get it done. Do that. Great. I'm gonna, Before we do this. the define the problem, evaluate solutions, just a couple of things that can be helpful. You might be really good at defining the problem, 
but have no idea what solutions could be, you could design an experiment of here's a few things, here's what I'm going to try. If you do that, I highly recommend doing a pre-mortem, which is pretend it's a month later and the thing totally failed. Why did it fail? And so you're identifying possible things ahead of time, which is really helpful. And there was another one. The notes are on the previous slide. I'm going to go back. Let's see. Oh, this is a fun one. Um, one of the blogs I follow said, um, ask yourself, if I want to be worse at this thing that I'm going to do, what should I do? If I want to be a worse roommate today, what should I do? If I want to be worse at my job today, what should I do? So you identify a very clear list of things not to do. Mm -hmm. There's some possible ideas, but pretty much the entire rest of this is make your plan, and if you have enough time to make, your, make a plan, plan. If not, you know, write it out and do it at some other point later. The reason why making a plan is important, there was a uh, TED Talk that James Cleaver gave. So they had groups who were trying to get in shape more. The control group was just told, getting in shape is good, and that was about it. And then there was this group that was giving a very inspirational speech. They worked out about the same, which is like 35%. The group that had to make a clear plan is like above 90% did. So the plan is really important. So that's the entire rest of the time is to do that. Thanks for watching, and P.S. Be a hero today.